Uh, we can begin, Kathy. Yeah, I think it's time. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the um, 2022 um, ACM Sigmetrics Rising Star Award um, presentation. So um, my name is Kathy Xia. Um, I'm chairing the committee this year. So um, let me give you a brief background about the Rising Star Research Award. Um, so the ACM Sigmetrics uh, Rising Star Award recognizes a junior researcher who demonstrate outstanding potential for research in uh, computer and communication performance evaluation. So um, um, the committee um, we formed for, for this year is um, basically me, and we have uh, four committee members, and Dr. Sarah Alou from INRIA, Dr. Liana Golubchik from USC, and uh, Dr. Long Bo Huan from Tsinghua, and Dr. Mark Squilante um, from IBM. So the committee um, has carefully examined all nominees and uh, finally we decided the winner this year is Dr. Julia Fanti from CMU. So uh, the award is to really um, given to honor her accomplishments on fundamental and interdisciplinary research on scalable systems for data sharing that ensure security and privacy. So this recognition includes uh, a 1500 honorarium. And uh, before we let her start her talk, let, let me briefly introduce um, Dr. Fanti. Okay. So Dr. Fanti is an assistant professor of ECE at CMU. And she obtained her PhD from um, UC Berkeley, uh, Department of EECS. Her research um, focused on the fundamental questions regarding security, privacy, and efficiency of distributed systems. Um, in particular, in the context of data sharing and the cooperation among uh, mutually untrusting parties. Um, her work has impacted um, really many real world systems ranging from, you know, differentially private data collection pipelines to cryptocurrencies to synthetic data platforms. So she's a two time fellow of the World Economic Forum of Global Future Council on Cybersecurity. She's also a member of the NIST uh, Information Security and Privacy Advisory Board. She has been recognized with uh, a Best Paper Award from ACM Sigmetrics and also a Best Paper from ACM Mobihawk. And she's a Sloan Fellowship uh, winner and also an Intel Rising Star Faculty Research Award winner and a US Air Force Research Young Investigate Grant Award winner. So without further ado, Let's um, uh, pass the stage to Dr. Fanti and uh, find out what more about her research. Thank you. Uh, also, congratulations to Dr. Fanti. Uh, thank you so much, Kathy, for the kind introduction. Um, I'll start the talk in just a minute, but I wanted to first express my deep gratitude for this honor. Uh, I'm incredibly thankful to the many mentors and advisors who helped me selflessly over the years as well as my amazing students and collaborators and to the Sigmetric Selection Committee and community. Um, so this community has been really, I think, unique in its willingness to accept research that's both interdisciplinary and spanning both theoretical and empirical work. Um, so for, for the students in the audience, I think Sigmetrics is a wonderful opportunity to interact with people who use different tools from yours, but share an interest in performance modeling, measurement, and analysis. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my journey in this space, which has consistently related to the role that networks play in designing good distributed systems. And I wanted to start with kind of a, a silly story. So recently I needed to meet with two colleagues, Sarita Adve from Illinois and Dejan Stefan at UCSD. And so Sarita started by sending out an email saying, can you meet at 10.30? And I said, sounds good, and sent out a calendar invite. But Sarita, who's very quick, sent out a calendar invite at the same time, which crossed paths. So we both realized our mistake, and so I immediately canceled my calendar invite. Then Sarita, who's very quick, canceled hers. And then, of course, Google Calendar messed up, and so Dan ended up with two meetings on his calendar. Now, this story is kind of silly on many levels, but fortunately for me, it's been studied for decades in the distributed systems community. So here a distributed system is a system whose components are located on different 
networked computers, but who act as a single service by passing messages between themselves. And this field of study was initiated by several giants of computer science in the early 80s. And the core question that they set out to ask was the following. How can a set of nodes come to agreement? In my case, how can my collaborators and I schedule a meeting? And these are just a subset of the people who made really foundational contributions. So this is not a, a complete uh, list of, of uh, the founders of distributed systems. But all kinds of amazing work arose from this seemingly simple question. Uh, but my focus in today's talk is not going to be on classical distributed systems and consensus algorithms. Instead, it's going to be on one of the central assumptions that underlies most of the work in the distributed systems literature. That is, how do we model the underlying network that the nodes use to communicate? Since the early 80s, there have been three main communication models in this community. The first is synchronous. This says that any time a node sends a message over the network, it's going to arrive at all the other nodes with some known maximum delay, delta. The partially synchronous model relaxes this a little bit and says that we still have some maximum delay delta, but it's unknown to the system designers. And finally, we have an asynchronous model where there's no maximum delay in our network. Now, the distributed systems community developed algorithms and bounds uh, that prov provide various properties under each of these three different network models. And some of these algorithms are uh, ubiquitous today. But since the early 80s, the scale and scope of distributed systems has increased significantly. So they obviously still form a cornerstone of resilient network systems, but they also appear in domains like peer-to-peer -peer systems, cellular networks, especially in emerging 5G deployments, and in blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And in each of these scenarios, the network plays a crucial role that's often difficult to abstract into a black box with a worst case delay. So the main message of this talk, if you take away only one thing, is that by being careful about how we model the underlying network that connects these computers, we can often analyze properties that were not obvious by treating the network as an abstract black box and correspondingly design better algorithms. So in general, I think there's a very interesting space of research questions around understanding how better distributed systems um, sorry, how better network models can help us to both analyze and design uh, distributed systems with properties like performance, robustness, privacy, security, and fairness, where the distributed system could be any application ranging from blockchains to web services to peer-to-peer -peer systems. So for concreteness, I'm going to narrow the scope of this talk by filling in the blanks in this map. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on blockchains, so for this talk, you don't need to understand how blockchains work. You just need to know that there are systems designed to maintain a consistent ledger of events, uh, for example, a sequence of transactions, among decentralized nodes, some of whom may be corrupt. Now, what properties do we want this distributed system to have? In general, we want them to be performant, secure, private, fair. And in my group, we've done work on all of these properties. However, in today's talk, I'm going to focus mainly on privacy, which is a topic I've been working on for the last decade. So in the blockchain community, um, when we try to enforce these des desired properties, typically it's helpful to think about a three layer stack. At the top layer, we have applications. So these are things like NFTs. So this is like one of these board eight <laughs> NFTs. Beneath that is the consensus layer. And this is where we're running those distributed uh, consensus protocols that I mentioned earlier. And finally, beneath the consensus layer, we have the network, which is used to connect the nodes in the consensus layer. Now, in the blockchain community in particular, uh, most of the time when we try to enforce these properties, we're working at the top two layers. So for example, people have proposed incentive mechanisms or new consensus protocols, um, or have used techniques like formal methods or new cryptographic tools to try to improve um, uh, the properties of blockchain systems. 
But until relatively recently, there was comparatively less work at the network layer. And actually, uh, many of the members of the Sigmetrics community have contributed to uh, starting to change that way of thinking. So in this talk, um, to summarize, I'll be asking how better network models can help us to analyze and design more private blockchains. But then at the end of the talk, I'll come back and discuss um, some other operating points in, in this space. So let's start by thinking about the analysis question. What can the network tell us about blockchain privacy? And this is going to be um, based on work that was done with Pramod Vishwam. So first, let me start with a brief primer on how Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network works. So nodes in the Bitcoin network are uh, identified in two different ways. The first is by public keys. Okay, so users have a pseudonym we can think of um, that identifies them in transactions. Now, nodes in the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network are connected in a network of TCP links. So a user who's running a node also has an IP address. So we can think of this user as having two different identities, or three different identities, really. Their real-world identity, their public key, and their IP address. Now, um, transactions or coins are also identified by a public key. So if Alice wants to send money to Bob, the first thing that she does is to create a transaction message that says Alice sends money to Bob, where each of those entities are identified by their public keys. Then she floods this message over the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network. And as this message floods, certain special nodes called miners pick it up and can start adding it to our global ledger that I mentioned earlier. Now, how does this relate to privacy? Well, there's two ways that we can think about privacy. The first is at the application and consensus layer, which is, can an observer link Alice's public key to her human identity? And in fact, there's been a huge amount of work in the literature on taking the public blockchain, which lists every transaction that's ever happened with these pseudonymous identifiers, and tries to cluster them and tries to use side information from the real world to link a public key to the human that owns that public key. Now, in this talk, we're going to focus on a different kind of privacy attack, which is, can a network observer guess which IP address originated a particular transaction. Um, now, notice that inferring Alice's IP address is not the same thing as de-anonymizing her, but it's often a, an important first step. So it's useful to understand how easy or difficult it is to make this linkage. So to understand this question, we started by looking back um, about a decade to a beautiful paper by Shah and Zaman, which analyzed the spread of rumors or epidemics over networks. So in their work, they assumed that a node starts an epidemic, which spreads according to a diffusion process. So in a diffusion process, each infected node is going to infect its neighbors with independent geometric or exponential delays. Okay, so we can trace the spread of this epidemic over time and at some point, after some amount of time, an observer or an adversary is given access to a snapshot of the infection. And this snapshot tells you which nodes have the disease and which nodes do not, without timestamps. So from this information, the adversary or the observer has to guess which node is the source or patient zero. Now in their work, Shah and Zaman showed that if the underlying graph is a deregular tree, not only is the maximum likelihood estimator computationally tractable, but we can also cleanly analyze its probability of detecting the correct source. In fact, if the tree is at least three regular, the probability of guessing the true source is lower bounded uh, in the limit by one fourth. So here, T is the time at which our snapshot is taken. So we're taking T large, so the snapshot is getting larger and larger. And P sub T is our probability of detection. So the probability of guessing the correct 
source. And here C sub D is a de degree dependent constant. So it depends on the degree of the underlying graph. And they showed that the, this limit is lower bounded by a quarter. And the intuition here is that the symmetry of our spreading process, coupled with knowledge of the network topology, allows us to identify the node at the center of this snapshot, which is the true source with, with some probability. Now, since the early work of Shan Zaman, many very nice papers came out of um, the Sigmetrics community and other neighboring communities, studying how these results generalize to other spreading models, graph topologies, and observation models. But the message remained fairly consistent. If you have a symmetric spreading process, like diffusion, you can usually identify the source. Now, this seems relevant to our Bitcoin problem, but we noticed that none of these models exactly modeled the way that blockchain peer-to-peer -peer networks work. So they make blockchains make some design choices that require new models and new analysis. So we set out to understand how these techniques can apply to blockchain privacy. In particular, we wanted to model some practical de-anonymization attacks that came out of the security community. And we call this model the eavesdropper model. So these attacks work as follows. Basically, researchers would set up what they called a super node, or in our case, an eavesdropper. And this super node would connect to every node in the peer-to-peer -peer network and basically just listen. So now if Alice generates a transaction, she's going to spread it to her neighbors as well as to the eavesdropper, just as if it were a regular peer. And the other nodes will also forward the message to the eavesdropper and so forth. So now if I'm the eavesdropper and I want to know which IP address originated a transaction, one simple estimator that I could use is the following. I could wait for the first node in the peer-to-peer -peer network that forwards me the transaction, and I'll guess that's the source. A very simple estimator. Now this estimator doesn't always work. What can happen is that because these spreading processes are randomized, Alice might spread the transaction to her neighbor, Bob, and Bob might forward the message to the eavesdropper before Alice herself does. So in that case, this very simple estimator that I, um, that I suggested would be incorrect, would fail. So the type of analysis that we're trying to do is to understand how well can an eavesdropper adversary infer the source IP of a Bitcoin transaction. And in particular, um, to do this analysis, we need to have a handle on the spreading process that's used in peer-to-peer -peer networks. And in fact, this spreading process was the topic of some discussion in this community. So until about 2015, the Bitcoin network used a spreading protocol called Trickle. And roughly, we can model Trickle in the following way. Each node chooses a random ordering of its neighbors, and forwards the message according to a discrete time process and uh, according to that ordering. So it might order first one, two, three, four. And at the end of those four time steps, all four of the neighbors have received the message. However, uh, around 2015, they transitioned to a different spreading model, which was diffusion. So as I mentioned earlier, in a diffusion spreading model, uh, the message will propagate according to independent exponential delays on each neighboring edge. And actually, the reason for this transition was explicitly privacy. You can see it in the GitHub comments. Uh, there's a line where they say, we're making this change for privacy reasons, but didn't really explain the reasoning as to why they thought diffusion would be um, a good thing to transition to. So we wanted to answer the question, first of all, is diffusion better than trickle? Uh, and second of all, what kind of guarantees can we get on, uh, or de-anonymization guarantees can you get under an eavesdropper adversary? So to analyze these questions, we looked, we started by analyzing deregular trees again. So we assumed the peer-to-peer -to -peer topology was a regular tree. Uh, and we have this eavesdropper adversarial model that I mentioned earlier. Now, our anonymity metric is again going to be the probability of correctly detecting the true source node uh, of a transaction, given two pieces of information. 
the underlying graph and the observed timestamps um, by, the, by the eavesdropper. So here, these tau i's are the time at which each node reports the transaction to the eavesdropper. And we decided to analyze two separate estimators. The first one we called the first spy estimator. And this is the estimator I suggested earlier, which just looks at the earliest node to report a transaction. So in this example, uh, this circled node would have been the, the first spy estimate because it has the smallest timestamp. We also analyzed the maximum likelihood estimator, um, which uh, takes into account the structure of the graph. Now uh, for some results. So this table is showing the asymptotic probability of detection as the degree D of the underlying tree increases. And I wanna point out two things about these results. The first is that if you use the first timestamp estimator, then as the degree of your graph increases, your probability of correctly detecting the source tends to zero. And this kind of makes sense intuitively because if I have more and more neighbors, the probability of one of them reporting to the eavesdropper before I do uh, increases. The second thing to observe is that if we use the maximum likelihood estimator, our probability of detection is bounded away from zero, um, which is uh, similar to what we saw earlier with the results of Shah and Zaman and subsequent ones. And this really shows the power of using the structure of your graph and knowledge of the spreading dynamics to get uh, to better reason about the privacy guarantees of an algorithm. So this goes back to my earlier message that by modeling this network, we can understand things that would otherwise have been difficult to observe. Um, the second thing that I wanna point out is that uh, asymptotically, the rates for trickle and diffusion look exactly the same, and actually the constants are pretty similar too. So the intuition here is that the symmetry of these spreading mechanisms outweighs any differences in local randomness. And so this suggests that moving from trickle to diffusion was not actually significantly helping in terms of privacy problems. Um, and I'll just briefly give an idea for how these kinds of things are proved. Um, so in particular, the result for diffusion under the maximum likelihood estimator. Um, so here I'm showing you an example of the spreading process where the middle node is the true source and the yellow nodes are the ones who have received the transaction at the time at which we do our estimation. Now, some of these nodes will have also reported to the eavesdropper. So we'll call those the blue nodes. So what we did was to analyze a potentially suboptimal estimator, which does the following. For each candidate source, it's going to look at each neighboring subtree and count the number of blue nodes in each of these subtrees. So here we have one, one, and two blue nodes, which is roughly balanced. So we think of this candidate source as a pretty good candidate. Whereas if we look at this other candidate source, we see that it has zero, one, and three blue nodes, which is more imbalanced. So we think of this as a less likely uh, source for our process. And so it turns out by analyzing this estimator using generalized polya urn processes and some concentration of measure results, you can show that um, the previous result, which is that we can detect the true source uh, with a probability that's bounded away from it. So to summarize um, this first portion of the talk, um, by modeling the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network in, in the Bitcoin scenario, we're able to identify privacy weaknesses that impact the application layer and that would not be visible otherwise. And we're also able to evaluate different design choices more systematically. Um, so I think this shows the power of actually you know, digging into the code so to do this kind of analysis, we ended up having to like dig through the GitHub code for um, the Bitcoin core peer-to-peer -peer layer and actually learned a lot about how it was working beyond what was written in documentation and papers. And so I think by doing that, um, it, it gave us a much more fine-grained understanding of what was going on and helped us to craft better models that we could then analyze.
Okay, so this suggests that um, this transition from trickle to diffusion was not maybe the right thing to do for privacy reasons. So this motivated a second project, which was on the design front. So can we design blockchain networks with better inherent privacy protections? Um, and this was a joint work with a number of talented collaborators, including Shailesh Venkatakrishnan, who's part of the Sigmetrics community as well, and uh, Pramod Vishwana. So to design better blockchain networks, um, we actually started by analyzing a slightly different adversarial model than the eavesdropper I mentioned earlier. And there's a few reasons for this, um, including that this other adversarial model was in some ways harder to defend against and also is a very practical attack as well and something that's quite easy to spin up. So this new adversarial model, I'll call the botnet adversary. And basically the botnet adversary says that we have some fraction P of spy nodes in our network. Um, so these spy nodes are uh, unknown uh, a priori, and they're going to observe all metadata in the network. So for example, if we decide to pass along some control packets with our transactions, these spy nodes are going to be able to see that. We also assume that these spies collude with one another um, and are honest but curious, at least to begin with. Um, so that means that they're following protocol fully. And we actually relaxed this assumption in, in later work, but for now, let's, let's assume that. Um, okay, so this was our adversarial model. We also slightly expanded our metric for anonymity. So remember previously we were analyzing probability of detection. For this portion of work, we are going to assume that we have some num n users and each user generates a single transaction. Now the adversary's job at the end of the dissemination of these transactions is to create some mapping from transactions to users. Now our metric has to evaluate how good this mapping is. And we do so using two, um, two metrics. The first is recall. So recall is effectively measuring the fraction of tr transactions that were correctly mapped to the right source. Um, and notice that in expectation, recall is a, exactly the same as probability of detection. So here we were not doing anything uh, different from the. However, in addition to recall, we also analyzed precision which is counting the number of correctly mapped transactions divided by the number of total transactions that were mapped to a given node. So here, for example, we're mapping the red transaction to the red user, um, but we're going to divide that by three because we mapped three total transactions to the red user. Okay. And precision is really trying to capture some notion of um, plausible deniability. So if you map all of the transactions to one user, you're going to map their true transaction correctly, but the user can also have plausible deniability and say, well, I couldn't possibly have generated all of these. Okay, so these are the metrics we analyzed. And notice that we want, uh, the adversary wants both of these to be high, but we as system designers are trying to provide privacy. So we want both of these to be as low as possible. So our goal then, was to design a distributed flooding protocol that minimizes the maximum precision and recall that are achievable by a computationally unbounded adversary. All right, so we started by trying to analyze some fundamental limits on this problem. Now, notice that if we fix a spreading protocol, let's say diffusion, and we fix an estimator, um, let's say the first spy estimator, that pair is going to have some expected precision and recall. So that pair can be represented as a single point on this two-dimensional grid. Now our first results showed that the precision and recall of any estimator and any flooding protocol is going to be contained within this central kind of almond shape. And 
This might look kind of uh, surprising to those of you who have worked with precision and recall before as metrics, but the reason for this is because we've tightly coupled the two uh, when we assumed that each user is generating one transaction. Um, and because of that, if our precision is very high, it means that our recall also should be high uh, and vice versa. So we're basically operating in this central uh, oblong shape. Now, for a fixed spreading protocol, as I vary, as the adversary tries out every possible estimator, they can achieve a region of precision recall points. So some estimators are going to be better than others and can trade off potentially precision for recall. So we're going to call the set of all points that are achievable, the achievable region for a particular spreading protocol. Okay, so this purple out, outline is meant to represent one example of such an achievable region. Now, next we showed that for any spreading protocol, your the maximum recall of your achievable region must be at least P, where P is, again, our fraction of spy nodes. So in other words, the rightmost point of this region has to be to the right of this vertical dotted line. We also showed that the maximum precision has to be at least P squared, um, which is going to be above this black dot. So in other words, we want as system designers, we want this achievable region to be as small as possible because we want our precision and recall to be small. But what this result is saying is that you cannot get a region that's smaller than this little green triangle. So we're trying to find a spreading protocol whose achievable region is as close as possible to this green triangle. Okay, so given this goal, we started by thinking about different ways of spreading transactions. And we proposed a spreading protocol called Dandelion. So Dandelion works as follows. Let's suppose our true message source is this node on the far left. This node is going to choose exactly one of its neighbors and it's going to pass the transaction to that neighbor. Now the neighbor is going to flip a weighted coin. If the coin lands heads, it's going to forward the transaction to one of its neighbors. And this continues until somebody flips tails. Now let's suppose this node flips tails. Then we transition into the spreading phase or the fluff phase, uh, which is basically just diffusing the, the transaction over the peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. And the reason we call this dandelion is because the spreading pattern looks like a dandelion seed head. Okay, so what's good about dandelion spreading? Well, we can show that it has an optimally low maximum recall of P plus O of one over N, where P again is our fraction of spies. And we showed earlier, or stated earlier, that we have a fundamental lower bound on uh, our maximum recall, which is exactly P. Okay. So this suggests that no matter what your network topology is, you can use dandelion spreading to get good recall. What this means is that now we just need to be careful. We just need to design our network topology to get good precision as well. So how do we do that? Um, well, in our protocol, we run dandelion over a topology that looks as follows. So in blue here, I'm showing you the regular peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's whatever exists today. In addition to that, we have an overlay, which is shown in the black lines, which we call the anonymity graph. And these black, uh, this black overlay is going to form a cycle, a line graph, over all of the nodes in the network. Now, if a transaction arrives, it's going to first start uh, by propagating clockwise over the anonymity graph until one of the nodes flips tails. When that happens, then it starts diffusing the message over the regular P2P. Similarly, if a second transaction arrives, it's also going to propagate clockwise over the same anonymity graph. Okay, that's important. Um, and at the end, it's uh, when someone flips tails, they're going to broadcast uh, using diffusion over, over their regular graph. 
So to summarize, the dandelion network policy uh, involves using dandelion spreading over the anonymity graph. And we have a topology that looks like a line graph or a cycle. Right? And we can show that by combining these components, um, dandelion has a near optimal maximum precision that looks like this. Okay, so here, our lower bound on precision was p squared. So we're achieving within a log factor. So going back to this figure from earlier, remember we wanted to um, have design a flooding protocol with a, a small achievable region. And what we can see is that dandelion is coming pretty close to the green triangle that we mentioned earlier, though it is taking a small hit in precision. And compare this to diffusion, which has a much larger achievable region, um, as well as flooding, which is kind of a naive baseline that we can think about. Uh, deterministic flood. So I wanted to give a little bit of intuition as to why dandelion um, is a good solution. And by and to do this, I wanted to explain a couple of topologies that actually don't work very well. So the first of these is a tree topology. Okay, so the idea here is that we arrange all of our nodes in a tree and nodes are going to pass transactions up towards the root. And it turns out that this topology has a precision of O of P. Remember our lower bound was O of P squared. So this is a suboptimal precision. Now what's going on here is that for every spy node that sits in the second to last layer, that spy node is going to perfectly be able to de-anonymize the leaves that sit beneath it. Okay. And the problem is that because there's a linear fraction of nodes in the second to last layer, and of those a fraction P of them are going to be adversarial, um, the adversary is able to de-anonymize a linear fraction of, um, of um, honest nodes transactions. So the intuition here is that trees have too many leaves. So we need a topology with fewer leaves. Now at the other end of this extreme, we could choose, for example, a complete graph, which has no leaves. And a priori, we thought that this would be a good topology, but it turns out that complete graphs also have a suboptimal precision. Now what's going on here is a little bit more subtle. So basically what happens is that the complete graph has too many edges. So what happens is that when a message starts at one of these nodes, there are too many potential paths that it can take to reach a given adversarial node. So what happens is the adversary is able to distinguish between messages from different sources more effectively. So the intuition here is that complete graphs have too many paths or too many edges internal. So we want a topology that has both few leaves and few edges total. Uh, and so a cycle graph uh, matches both of those requirements. Um, okay, so this is dandelion. Uh, we, did a, we did some work on trying to relax assumptions that we made on dandelion. And actually the process of trying to translate this into a practically viable algorithm uh, has been really interesting <laughs> and a good lesson in where theory and practice uh, kind of break down or don't meet very well. Um, but to start out, we, um, we implemented Dandelion on Bitcoin Core, which is the largest Bitcoin client uh, today. And we evaluated the trade-offs, the empirical trade-offs that result from using Dandelion compared to using just Diffusion today. So here in this plot, I'm showing you on the horizontal axis, the path length of the Dandelion stem. Okay. Um, so this is ranging from zero to 12. And on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the empirical time that we needed to reach 10% of nodes in the Bitcoin network. And we actually measured this by setting up an eavesdropper node uh, and, and tracking when, um, when our transactions that we generated are received by the eavesdropper. 
So each of these red pluses indicates the arrival time of a transaction at our eavesdropper node, um, or the time to reach 10% of, of the nodes in the network. So what we found is that this trade-off is relatively mild. Um, so if you don't use dandelion at all, it was taking about six seconds uh, to reach 10% of nodes. And if we use dandelion with a hop length of say 10 in expectation, um, we're adding about two seconds of latency. Now, for those of you who work in traditional communication networks, two, two seconds of latency sounds like horrible. <laughs> um, but the thing to observe here is that in these peer-to-peer -peer networks, actually the latencies tend to be a lot larger. Um, so as you can see, when without dandelion, the latency is already six seconds. Um, so these kinds of delays are acceptable in certain kinds of blockchains that are public and are relying on these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer forwarding mechanisms. Um, okay, so we also did some work on trying to relax some of the assumptions and analyze what happens if only some nodes are using Dandelion and others are not. And in the end, um, we actually found to our surprise a, a very nice uh, reception from a lot of cryptocurrencies that decided to implement Dandelion in their own uh, systems. So today Dandelion has been implemented in Monero, Zcash, um, Beam, Mimblewimble, or Grin, sorry. Uh, and it's currently under implementation or evaluation in Bitcoin Core and Ethereum. Um, and actually the use case in Ethereum is pretty interesting. Um, so they're actually not using they're thinking of using Dandelion not to obfuscate transactions, but to hide the IP addresses of um, block proposers or miners um, once they transition to a proof of stake system. So if the, that jargon didn't mean anything to you, it's fine. But the point is this, um, this algorithm Dandelion is potentially is being evaluated uh, to prevent denial of service attacks in the Ethereum peer-to-peer -peer network instead of uh, protecting the privacy of individual transactions. Um, so that was an interesting new use case that we hadn't initially foreseen. So to summarize um, this design portion, uh, we found that by modeling the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network, we were able to design better algorithms for protecting application level properties like privacy. We were able to analyze those properties formally. So. Um, all right, so let's come back to this uh, kind of design space that I talked about earlier. Um, so in ongoing work, uh, we've been exploring or trying to expand this design space along several axes. So in particular, I'm currently very interested in designing secure and fair payment systems. Um, so not necessarily cryptocurrencies, um, just regular payment systems. And I wanted to give a couple of examples of that. So the first one is related to international settlements. So today, if I want to send money to um, someone in India, at Sigmetrics, let's say, that money has to go through many intermediary hops. And these intermediaries often are time consuming. And in some cases, they can even involve manual checks, for example, evaluating um, whether the transaction is suspicious or um, maybe exceeds certain thresholds for international tr um, transfers. So as a result of these inefficiencies, um, a lot of countries today are evaluating the use of centrally banked digital currencies or CBDCs. So these digital currencies would be basically a digital version of cash so a digital version of central bank money that can be transmitted either within a country or uh, across borders. And this last question I think is extremely interesting because we have right now many different countries that are evaluating their own CBDC systems. And they're not being designed a priori to be interoperable with one another. So as a result, um, you basically have a scenario where different countries are operating their own systems and don't necessarily have a central trusted party. So in today's financial system, the, the US dollar plays a disproportionate role. And a lot of countries would like to move away from that model uh, to a more egalitarian system. So 
As a result, a lot of countries are evaluating blockchain-based systems for settling international transactions. Um, but it remains very unclear what kind of design is the right, uh, is the right one. And what are the trade-offs in terms of performance, uh, efficiency, security, and fairness? Um, and in particular, I, I think there's some really interesting questions around modeling the communication networks between these countries and taking into account the distances between different nations and how that can impact the fairness of these international settlement systems, particularly if they're using Byzantine fault-tolerant algorithms. Um, so, yeah, so I'm really interested in trying to understand some of the unexpected biases, uh, problems related to fairness and security that can arise from modeling the networks in these international settlement systems for CBDCs. Um, okay, another example is related to how the access points to payment networks can impact their fairness and security. So today, uh, mobile money is a, a huge mode of, of payment, especially in a lot of African countries. So you may have heard of M-Pesa, um, which is a mobile money system that's uh, it originated in Kenya, but has become popular in other countries as well. Um, however, mobile money, uh, mobile money is, has been tremendous in terms of increasing financial inclusion in the continent. Uh, but it relies critically on access to mobile phones, as you might, as you might expect. Um, and in particular, a lot of countries have started placing laws uh, requiring you to provide national ID in order to get a SIM card. So in a recent set of projects, um, we've been exploring how these ID registration laws affect the ability of users to onboard onto these networks and affect their ability to access these networks, which has huge implications for, um, for financial inclusion. Similarly, in these mobile money networks, uh, many users are either illiterate or technologically illiterate, which requires them to hand over trust to human agents who help them to cash in and cash out in, in mobile money transactions. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, oftentimes people will just hand over their pin to this agent and the agent actually executes the transfer for them. So as you can imagine, both of these observations can lead to uh, both fairness concerns as well as security and fraud concerns. So in a recent initiative uh, at CMU, uh, we've established a center called Scilab Africa. Uh, which is a collaboration between our Pittsburgh campus and our campus in Kigali, Rwanda. And as part of this initiative, we're trying to understand how cybersecurity impacts financial inclusion in Africa. And one of the big projects that we've been spearheading as part of this initiative is related to running large scale user surveys um, for trying to understand uh, how these realities of how the access points to these financial payment systems uh, impact the, their fairness and security. So we're currently in the process of um, trying to get these studies uh, off the ground and are hoping to start collecting data very soon. Um, but I'm really excited about trying to understand not just the internal technical mechanics of, of these payment networks, but also understanding how they interact with humans and how the gateways to these networks impact their efficacy. So, um, so I really do believe that when we talk about how modeling networks can impact application layer properties, that also involves thinking about users and it also involves thinking about um, attributes that may be difficult to model um, in a mathematical way. Okay, so the take home messages from this talk are that first of all, the communication network plays a central role in distributed systems. Uh, I, hope, I hope you're convinced of that. Um, we've seen several examples where modeling the communication network can change uh, what application layer properties we're able to achieve and uh, analyze. 
Um, and I think a really interesting open question uh, for the community is how to design, how to co-design networks and distributed systems. And to some extent, this may be application specific, um, but also I think that there's a more general interesting question about um, like some of these abstract distributed systems problems and trying to understand how to model network dynamics in a more fine-grained way than those three initial models that I mentioned. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and uh, for coming. And I would also like to thank my many amazing collaborators, including those whose work was discussed in this talk, as well as uh, more broadly on blockchains and distributed systems from a number of universities. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take questions. So first, uh, you know, um, congratulations again to Julia and also thanks for the great talk. Um, any questions from the audience or maybe from online? <clears throat> Jakey? Yeah, Professor Nair and uh, raised a hand. That means there is a call, there is a question from the audience. Uh, hi. Uh, so in the uh, problem of trying to find the IP address of the originators of these transactions, so you still require some of the nodes to be uh, honest, right? So I don't know that much about blockchain, but my understanding is that a lot of the point is that it should be trustless. So is there an economic incentive for the nodes to be honest? And if not, I mean, can you expect that most of the nodes uh, be honest? So even if you have, say, 1%, then it's still a 1% probability to uh, identify the originator of the transaction, right? Um, yeah, so there's a couple of, of questions embedded there. The first one um, about can you expect nodes, are nodes incentivized to be honest? Um, yes and no. So a lot of nodes, a lot of nodes in the network are just running default client software. So the default client software is spreading transactions in whatever way it was programmed to by, um, you know, by the developers. So most nodes are not messing with these settings from, from measurements that have been done. Um, however, it is certainly possible that certain nodes would want to change these uh, spreading settings. However, one thing to observe here is that there are kind of um, uh, some incentive mechanisms baked into the peer-to-peer -peer network. So for example, if you join the peer-to-peer -peer network and you consistently do not um, follow protocol, nodes can uh, block list you and will not peer with you in the future. So there are some built-in, some baked in incentive mechanisms for following protocol, um, which are not, watertight, but can can help to ensure that you have a, a sufficient number of nodes that are following protocol enough. Um, the other question about uh, 1%, you know, if 1% of your nodes are uh, malicious, then you have a 1% chance of, of detecting the source. That's absolutely right. And this is uh, related to the lower bounds that we mentioned. If you use these kinds of approaches to anonymize transactions, there are limits to how much you can do, and it's going to depend on how many spies are in your network. So this, um, this defense is really meant more to protect against services that are trying to like blanket de-anonymize uh, all transactions. So for example, there are paid services uh, like Chainalysis, whose entire business model is uh, like blockchain analytics. So they'll run services to try to um, infer or like link transactions to IP addresses, for example. And so we're trying to provide some degree of privacy to uh, the average case, um, but this doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily going to protect against a targeted adversary who's trying to target a single, uh, single node. Thank you. So any other questions? So for the audience, um, online audience, if you want to ask a question, simply raise your hand, please. Uh, hi. Please go uh, ahead. Yeah. Uh, so my question is regarding the mac maximum likelihood uh, estimate on the D regular tree. Mm -hmm. So you uh, look at how balanced or unbalanced each tree rooted at each neighbor is, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose, uh, suppose 
the graph is not deregular uh, uh what like if we do the same kind of analysis just okay. compare how uh balanced those neighboring neighboring trees are mm -hmm. uh, uh, what what happens then um good question so there has been analysis on um random trees and it turns out in that case you can you can do similar types of analysis but the the analysis just becomes a lot uh more complicated um for general graphs that are not tree structured uh, the question, the issue becomes a little bit trickier. So one approach that people have tried is for each candidate source, you generate a spanning tree from that candidate source and, um, and then evaluate under, if that had been the true uh, topology that the message used to spread, in that case, how, how central would the, observe, would the observations be? Or like how symmetric would the observations be? So for each candidate source, you're going to have a different spanning tree. Um, and for this, yeah, for it, so you'll have a different spanning tree for each candidate source. And then for each candidate source, you end up with a different measure of centrality and you pick the node with the highest centrality. Um, this approach has not been analyzed for general graphs. Getting any kind of guarantees for general graphs is hard. Um, but it seems to work reasonably well in empirical experiments. Question? Um, uh, this is a question related to maybe the first question, um, uh, incentive compatibility. So in the underlying uh, uh, protocol, uh, if an individual, let us say, um, uh, has a, tosses a coin and uh, the outcome is such that it's passed to the next individual. Um, what is, uh, is there an incentive for this person to trigger a diffusion, not follow the protocol and trigger a diffusion? Um, and similarly for somebody that uh, has to trigger the diffusion based on the coin toss, is there an incentive to pass it on and not follow the protocol? Uh, what's your specific uh, intuition on this protocol? Um, which side, uh, uh, well, which is the better thing to do for an individual to trigger the diffusion or to just pass it on? Uh, um, good question. So the, the more likely event is that they will choose to trigger diffusion early because that will cause the transactions to flood faster and that helps, um, that helps the system uh, mine that transaction faster. Um, in general, honest nodes would not really have an incentive to trigger diffusion early because this is somebody else's transaction. And so like it, it doesn't really matter to them if this other person's transaction gets mined faster. Um, however, uh, in our, uh, I, I mentioned that in some subsequent work, we tried to analyze what happens if nodes decide not to follow protocol. And there we assume that anytime you hit reach a spy node, they're going to trigger diffusion early. Uh, and so we showed that even if that happens, well, if that happens, you do get some degradation in your precision guarantees, um, but it's, uh, it's not too much. So um, yeah, so in terms of incentives for this particular protocol, we have chosen an operating point that is that favors robustness of broadcasting transactions over privacy. So in cert for certain kinds of misbehavior, um, like a node might try to prevent the transaction from getting flooded at all. Uh, and in that case, we revert to, um, revert to just flooding for diffusing the message from the true source. And um, this is a design choice that really came from talking to practitioners. Like given the trade-off between privacy and utility, they're going to err on the side of uh, utility. Um, and this is kind of what I was mentioning about how the, the process of trying to translate the theoretical guarantees from our first uh, paper to an actual real world system has been kind of interesting and, and shown where some gaps or mismatches start to arise. <laughs> 
um so uh so regarding the randomly and you are passing to one person until you diffuse so uh so i i'm i don't know much about uh, blockchain but if you do a control diffusion like diffuse to only k instead of to all uh mm-hmm. like from the beginning and then you control the parameter k uh mm-hmm. to see uh, to do a balance between speed and uh, the recall probability uh, is that a viable thing or um it's a natural thing to um uh, suggest but if we look at the earlier results from Shan Zaman we find that even if you're so k, that parameter k that you mentioned is kind of like the degree of the tree that we're diffusing over um so by decreasing k it is true that you can get a lower probability of detection but what we saw in that initial uh paper is that even if the degree is small is like 3 you're still getting high probability of detection and that's happening just because of the symmetry uh in in the underlying graph so diffusing but at a lower rate or to fewer of your neighbors um doesn't seem to solve solve this problem okay and also uh, another question so like in the diffusion case uh, you're trying to identify ibstoffer is trying to identify the source mm-hmm. so so another one way also can be trying to find a node which has the shortest path to all the other nodes uh, so that that is also one way uh, you can find the source uh yeah that's that's good intuition um so actually the estimators that um the estimators that were proposed by Shan Zaman and by later uh works as well are cent- largely centrality based and you can think of those as trying to find the node like in the middle of the in the middle of the snapshot which can be viewed as trying to minimize the distance there's different ways of calculating centrality and people have done analysis on different variants of uh, of centrality at based estimators um but the intuition that you mentioned is is right spot on yeah like slightly modified facility location where you have just one facility uh sorry i don't thought what facility location facility location problem like we oh. will get submodular submodularity like try to find a facility location which is closest to all person kind of sure. yeah it's at shortest distance from, from all mm-hmm. just that here it won't be a direct connection to all but you can find a path to all right? to the through the yeah. mm-hmm. okay um um hi julia very interesting and nice talk um i just um i have two points uh one is that uh, in the dandelion protocol you uh, you find a topology right that basically you you arrange um, all the nodes in the network in a circle mm-hmm. right Yeah. and i wanted to know if um, the ordering of these nodes how do you gen- like is it just randomly arranged in a line or um is the the, the ordering matters right what if you put uh, two nodes that actually have a very large link delay mm-hmm. um like right, right you know that node yeah. has to pass to this node so um so that that is one point and the second one is um so basically in the dandelion protocol you're passing from one node to the other until it diffuses no mm-hmm. so at the point of diffusion it just basically becomes a sub problem you can just um uh, become a sub network no so you can apply the same uh, eavesdrop technique or spy node technique on the sub network correct so um maybe you're eliminating a few nodes along the path but it's just uh i mean uh, is yes that's that's exactly right um yeah so in the analysis we actually assume that once you start diffusing you can find the center of that diffusion exactly and then the goal is to figure out which of the previous nodes in the cycle was the uh, was the true originator that's how the analysis is broken down um yeah, so, so yeah your intuition is is exactly right so but regarding um, the topology uh, of uh, the uh, way of forming the circle how to form it so right. how how right. do you do it in dandelion 
yeah, uh, another great question. Um, so in practice, what we uh, what we ended up doing in our later work was to relax the condition of an exact cycle to a two out um, random graph. So basically each node is already part of the regular peer-to-peer -peer network and picks um, two of its outbound connections as, um, as, uh, as the anonymity graph. So they're always going to pass transactions on one of these two outbound edges. Um, so this is a slight modification of the protocol that I uh, mentioned. I just didn't go into it because of time and for details, but um, the, the challenge is exactly what you said. We, we need to be able to construct this anonymity graph in a fully distributed way. And so what we ended up doing in the practical implementations is uh, using the connections that are already set up and using only a subset of them for the anonymity graph. Uh, and then we tried to analyze what happens if you do some, if you do this, use this kind of a topology instead in our, in our follow-up. Thank you. I'll go through the paper as well. Thanks. Okay, now it's time to wrap up. Thank you for all the great questions. And also let's uh, thank um, and Julia again for the great talk and congratulations. Okay, thanks. Bye bye.